Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Tourette Association of America for mental health and suicide prevention in the Tourette syndrome community. Slides for this presentation will be available in a follow-up email that all registrants will receive after the presentation. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers today. Dr. Doreen Marshall is the VP of Mission Engagement at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. She is a psychologist with experience that spans clinical, education, and professional settings. Dr. Marshall has been engaged in local and national suicide prevention and postvention work for more than 15 years. She holds a doctorate in counseling um, psychology from Georgia State University and a master's degree in professional counseling and a bachelor's degree in philosophy and English from the College of New Jersey. Dr. Barbara Coffey is an internationally recognized specialist in Tourette disorders and related disorders. She is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Division Chief in the Child and Adult Psychiatry Department at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Miami, Florida, which is the location of a TAA Center of Excellence. She is also co-chair of the Tourette Association of America's Medical Advisory Board and is highly sought after as a speaker at worldwide conferences. Cheryl Cardall is a mom of five children, five children, ages 10 to 11. Due to family circumstances in recent years, she's become a passionate educator and advocate for parents raising children with various challenges, including mental health issues. Tourette syndrome, behavioral and, ed and educational issues. Cheryl has a bachelor's degree in human and family development with an emphasis in early childhood education. She has been coaching and strengthening moms and families for over a decade. She is also the host of Fight Like a Mother podcast. Alan Schaaf is a recent graduate from Perry High School in Canton, Ohio, as a part of the class of 2021. He is a youth ambassador and intern for the Tourette Association of America. Alan was officially diagnosed with Tourette syndrome in 2017 and underwent training to be a youth ambassador in 2019. He has been an advocate for mental health, suicide, and Tourette syndrome since. Today, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Feel free to put questions in the Q&A section of your panel at any time during the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we will ask you to complete a survey. We are funded by the CDC to bring programs like this one to you. So please take a moment to fill out a short survey at the end of the program as your input is valuable for our future programming. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. So with that, I will give the virtual floor to Dr. Marshall and thank you. Thanks, Diana, and, and thanks to the Tourette's Association for hosting this important event. Um, I, I'm always pleased to be able to share uh, what we know about suicide prevention. And at my time at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, one of the things that I do a lot of is speak to different groups, sharing what we've learned. Um, so I believe there's some slides that we're going to see in a second. Um, the other thing I just wanted to share quickly is that September is uh, Suicide Prevention Month. And so this is a month where many of us that work in prevention have been really leaning into sharing our knowledge and having discussions like these. So I'm going to get started on the content. We could advance to the next slide, please. There we go, okay. So one of the things I get asked pretty frequently is, you know, why does suicide happen? And we like to share this graphic because I think it explains both how complex suicide is, but also that there are numerous things that uh, intersect to cause an experience of hopelessness and in a vulnerable individual. So I'm gonna talk really quickly. And so what I want you to imagine is that we all have risk factors. So some of us have risk factors across biology, psychology, and our environment. Um, some of us may just have some risk factors and not others. But the idea is that we all have different risk factors that kind of intersect. And this is very dynamic, it's changing over time. So some of the bio biological risk factors are things we're born with. Um, it could be um, just our, our 
stress response, our biological stress response. Um, it could be a, a predisposition toward uh, depression or other mental health concerns. It could be um, other things that are rooted in our biology, including uh, physical diagnoses, you know, diagnosis of a chronic illness. These are the kinds of things that are biological factors that we know can put people at an increased risk for suicide, but that's not the whole picture. So we also have psychological factors, and those are things like um, whether you tend to be an optimist or a hopeful person, whether you tend to be able to connect to reasons for living. Um, you know, there's various things that are much more centered in our psychology, in our mind. And so those things intersect with those biological factors, but then we also have things in our environment. So, you know, if you are more isolated, if you live in an area of the country that is more isolated, less populated, your risk for suicide is higher. Um, if you live in an environment um, where you have easy access to lethal means, your risk is higher. So again, these things in isolation don't lead to suicide, but part of the complexity of suicide is how these things intersect with each other. And then what also happens is you have these risk factors, but then you also have your current life events, um, things that are happening in our day-to-day -day lives that maybe cause more or less stress for us. And so this is, like I said, a dynamic interaction, but what you want to imagine is these risk factors intersect with current life stressors to create a, a situation where you have a vulnerable individual who then feels hopeless. And then they also have access to lethal means or a way of ending their life. And that's those factors coming together is what most likely leads to an outcome of suicide. Now, the good news is many more of us have these risk factors than go on to die by suicide. In fact, most of us live with various risk factors. So um, I have a family history of mental health concerns. That is something that is rooted in biology. So that's a risk factor I may carry through my life. You know, where some of our risk factors may be much more rooted in our environments, and those are things that can be modifiable. Next slide, please. So one of the things we pay a lot of attention to when we think about prevention is mental health. And one of the things we know is that the vast majority of people who die by suicide often had a mental health concern that was either undiagnosed or diagnosed and maybe undertreated or untreated, or that treatment wasn't um, bearing benefit or wasn't successful for an individual. But our mental health is super important. And we know that prevention means protecting our mental health and also um, being proactive about taking care of our mental health. Next slide, please. So we think of when someone is struggling with thoughts of suicide that they tend to show some warning. Um, we think about roughly eight out of 10 people will give some indicator that they're struggling. And people tend to display these warning signs in three categories, uh, talk, behavior, and mood. So what you wanna look for if you're worried about somebody is a change in how they usually are. So a change in the way they speak, a change in their behavior, or a change in their mood. So they may say things um, that indicate hopelessness or that they're thinking of ending their life. They may even mention suicide directly. Um, they, their behavior may change. They may start to um, behave in ways that are uncharacteristic of them, more risk-taking, um, starting to use substances or increasing their substance use. Um, they may also um, start to give away possessions or start to act in a way that looks like they're making final arrangements or wrapping things up. And then finally, you see changes in mood. So you may see a worsening mood in terms of a, a mental health condition like depression or anxiety, um, but we often see changes in mood as another warning sign. So next slide, please. So if you are worried about someone, I think there's a couple of things to do. One, you wanna trust your gut, you don't wanna wait. If you're thinking that someone may be at risk, you want to take the extra step and ask them directly if they're having thoughts of suicide. 
most people are afraid to do that, but we know that when you ask directly, you're really opening the door for communication and really letting that person know that you are a trusted person that they can share those thoughts with. You know, we, we can't underestimate the importance of listening and not reacting in a way that tries to solve the problem, but more listening and then trying to connect the person to mental health health. And of course, you should always do this in a way that expresses concern and caring. So letting the person know, I care about you, you matter to me, I wanna help you get the help you need. I may not know exactly how to do that, but I'm gonna help you figure that out. We're gonna figure it out together. But it's really important that you trust your gut if you're worried about someone and that you reach out and start to open a dialogue about mental health and suicide. Next slide, please. So I want to take a few minutes to tell you about our work at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, we are a national nonprofit uh, with national offices in New York City and Washington, D.C., and we have chapters in all 50 states. And the only thing you need to, to have uh, to join one of our chapters is an interest in preventing suicide. So our chapters are made up of uh, people from all walks of life that have their own lived experience of suicide, people who have lost family members or supported family members who have struggled, people who have struggled themselves. And we all kind of come together uh, to do education events, different uh, awareness events, and really um, just kind of raise the conversation or elevate the conversation about how to prevent suicide. Next slide, please. So really quickly, I'll just share that our work is across multiple categories. Um, AFSP is the largest private funder of suicide prevention research in the United States. We also have an advocacy office in DC that focuses on um, basically sharing state and federal legislation. Oh, I hope I didn't cut out there, there we go. Um, supports state and federal legislation related to mental health and suicide prevention. We do prevention education programming as well as loss and healing programming to support those who struggle as well as those who have um, experienced the death of a family member by suicide or anyone they know. And then again, our chapters are in all 50 states and we have a program called the Interactive Screening Program that um, is on college campuses around the country that helps connect uh, college students to health. Next slide, please. Here's some pictures of our chapter events. Um, most of our chapters are volunteer run with a support staff in each of the states. And again, all you need to join a chapter is just an interest in supporting suicide and suicide prevention events. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more or getting involved, um, you know, I think the best things you can do during this month, um, but even past this month, is to be vigilant and to think about those who may be struggling in your life and have an open dialogue about suicide and not be afraid to ask them directly if they're thinking about suicide. You can learn more at our website at AFSP.org. We have um, lots of virtual events, including education and programming. You can learn more on our website, as well as uh, awareness walks that we do around the country. You can find your local chapter at afsp.org forward slash chapters. Uh, you can sign up to be a field advocate, which basically is you get an email alert when there's something related to mental health or suicide prevention that you can contact your local representatives about. I think a real easy step is to just put the crisis numbers in your phone. So if you weren't aware, we have a national suicide prevention lifeline. That number 1-800-273-TALK or 8255 is a national number that you can call 24 seven and get a live person who can um, talk you through a situation if you're calling on behalf of someone else. If you're calling because you're struggling, they can talk with you and help connect you to resources. There's also the crisis text line, which you can text the word talk to 741741 and get a live person over text to respond to you. And again, I would just say, you know, if you want to learn more about our work to follow us over social media, um, we are on all the, the social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, because we're constantly putting out information about events, but also um, about things you can do to help prevent suicide. 
Um, I think that might be my last slide. Let's see, one more slide. Okay, yes. Um, so here are the resources. I'm happy to share more about them. But again, I, I would encourage you to put the lifeline numbers in your phone. And I'm happy to answer questions as we get near the end about any of these resources. But I hope you will keep them and, and uh, research them so you can learn more about suicide prevention and our work. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Alan, who is speaking next. Um, thank you for your time. And Alan, take it away. Thank you, Doreen. So um, as said, originally, my name is Alan Schof. I am a youth ambassador in Internal Threat Association. And throughout my Tourette's Dirt journey, one of the things that I've had to deal with through that was also struggle with suicide myself. So um, one of the big things is it started around the age of 10 and kind of lasted to the age of 16, the ideation did, um, through various factors. Um, the big one was just bullies and then certain other things with, with medical conditions, mainly anxiety and a lot of emotional things. All of this came to a head uh, my freshman year in high school. It was when I first got diagnosed with threat syndrome in 2017. And it caused my anxiety, my depression, and my tics to get a lot worse, which led to a lot of other factors to get worse as well. Um, there was one night in December where I was talking to a friend of mine, and I was ready to take my life. And thankfully, uh, they notified my parents. My mom came in, and they took me to the hospital. And after I stayed, stayed overnight at the hospital in psych ward, I got taken home and there was a two month period where I had agoraphobia, which is basically where you are scared to leave your house. You're too anxious to face the outside world. Um, I had pretty severe depression. I was lucky if I left my bed during that stint, that period of time. Uh, I'm doing much better now. Obviously, I'm able to speak to you today. And um, there were a lot of things that went into getting me to the point I'm at today. It obviously wasn't just a magical snap of the fingers to cause me to overcome a lot of these things. Uh, one of the biggest ones, as um, Doreen mentioned, was the um, just how to help someone who's struggling. I was thankful to have people who were willing to step in. Uh, I recognized that I had this amazing support system that was there for me. Um, the two biggest were my parents. They were just, they were there for me regardless of everything. And I also had two siblings and many other family members who supported me throughout it all, as well as a ton of amazing friends. And they, they didn't know the official steps to take as how to be there for somebody, but they didn't really need that. All they were was just a shoulder that I needed. Um, just whenever I felt ready, to take a small step to make the jump to be able to go face the world again and get to the point where I wasn't as depressed or anxious and wasn't dealing with suicidal ideation as bad as I was, they were there for every step of the way. Um, another one of the biggest things that was a huge help, and they definitely helped me start to do this, was um, regardless of how difficult things get, especially in that moment during that time period, and I still have to do this today, even though I'm doing much better now and I don't deal with the suicidal thoughts or ideation, is just simply reminding myself that I got through it, that I'm still here today. Um, the night, the days that got really bad where I just was, I was ready to go. I didn't want to live. I just have to sit back and think, I thought the same thing last night too, and I'm still here for today. And I'm probably going to think the same thing again tomorrow, but I know for a fact that I'm going to be strong enough to be able to get through this. I have people here that are going to help me get through it and that it's going to be okay. Um, this is something that's definitely easier said than done, and I recognize this, but um, appreciating the little good moments when it feels like there are none is one of the things that kind of, that it's not kind of, it definitely helped me out the most. Um, just as a small example, I have a friend, he's, his name is Jake House. He's like my best friend. And during this two month period, while where I didn't leave my house, every morning he would send me a video of him doing something ridiculous. Like I think one of them was him going ding dong ditching to his neighbor across the street and then doing this little evil cackle after he rang the doorbell. 
And it just, it would make me smile. And it was during a time where I didn't think, you know, being able to laugh and smile was even possible. So just moments like that. And then moments where I'm hanging out with my dad and we're watching some movie that he's been dying to show me or listening to music. Just moments like that, that when you're at your lowest and you're struggling with suicide, you don't think are possible to have to be able to just a moment to be happy about. Because a lot of times when you're struggling with this, it's that constant mood of depression that you feel like you can't get out of. And I know for at least for me, there were moments that weren't just lathered in all of that that I had that were happy and were good and were stuff that would be able to help me get better that I was unable to see because I was too focused on everything that led me to the point where I was. So, and I, I understand how difficult it is to be able to recognize these moments when you're feeling this way. But it's when you're able to just get in that mindset, it's something that definitely helps a lot. And um, the last thing was letting go of things either from the past or just things that are happening right now that cannot be controlled. Because those are some things that can weigh you down, that constantly are on your mind, that make you have those feelings of depression or anxiety. And they're things that though they're not good to be going through and yes of course you would want them not to be happening there are certain things in life that we just can't control so uh, i know everyone has probably used this example but let's take lockdown for example i have severe anxiety and i have depressive mood swings not being able to see people and things like that caused me to have some flare-ups and panic attacks it was it's not something that I can control that we're in lockdown. It was something that I had to focus on and say, we're gonna take this one step at a time. We're gonna focus and do what we need to, to prevent myself from slipping back into the ID, uh, the suicidal ideation. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of you that are thinking of things that have caused you to feel very anxious and depressed and would cause you to slip back into these mood swings of having these thoughts. But there are certain things, of course, that just cannot be controlled. and it's not an easy thing to be able to say, I, I have no control over this. I'm not gonna let it affect how far I've come, but it's definitely something that is a step that once you are able to take that is very good in helping recovery and getting out of those thoughts and mindsets. That's all for me. Thank you, Alan. Um, really appreciate you sharing that and your story. And with that, we'll pass it on to Cheryl. Alan, I just have to say, I'm so glad you're still here. I'm so glad you chose to stay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I am too. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me. I have a sinus infection. So if I cough or sneeze or something, I have a cough drop in my mouth. But um, I wanted to come on here and share some of our story. Um, I am uh, the mom of five kids, ages 11 to 22. And I have multiple kids who struggle with some mental health challenges. All five of them have anxiety to one degree or another, some pretty intense. Um, some struggle with depression, some ADHD. I have one teenage son with Tourette syndrome. I say we swim in mental health soup at our house. Um, six months ago, I got a call at 1130 at night. I didn't answer the first time due to being asleep. They called back. I didn't answer the second time due to being groggy. I answered the third time and saw that it was one of my son's 16 year old friends. He said, Cheryl, I needed to call you because Garrett, who is my son, texted me and told me that he tried to end his life tonight. And I needed to let you know this. Because of that phone call, my son is alive today. I'm so grateful for parents who empower their kids to be brave and courageous, to make a difficult phone call in the middle of the night to tell me about my son. We were able to get him the medical treatment he needed and so that he is alive today. Um, we would have had a different outcome had that sweet boy not made that difficult phone call. So I bought him a t-shirt that says, not all heroes wear capes. And I am so grateful for that support system that my son had during that time. Garrett is my teenage son with Tourette syndrome and multiple other mental health challenges. And some are quite intense. We have dealt with suicidal ideation and attempts at our house the last two to three years. 
it has been painful and scary. Sometimes life just feels like too much for him. So we have changed some things at our house um, to keep him alive, to keep him connected with us as a family. I wanna share a quote with you from L.R. Nost that sums up these three key things we focus on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I added a, a few words to this quote, but it says, one day your child will make a mistake or a bad choice or be in a bad place mentally and run to you instead of away from you. And in that moment, you will know the value of peaceful, positive, respectful parenting. Um, that is what we aim to do at our house. And so we have just discovered that connection and rela our relationship with our son is the most important thing that we can focus on. It isn't always easy. He can be difficult and defiant, but we know that a connected relationship can save his life. So we work very hard on working on ourselves and our own triggers so that we can come to him and be the calm in the storm of his life. Um, we heard Alan talk a lot about connection when he's had friends that sent him funny videos or he sat and watched a game with his dad or something. And we know that that connection is so vital. It, and we can't do this alone as parents. Um, we have to have a community around us, especially when things are really difficult. So having friends and extended family, coaches, teachers, et cetera, for them to connect with so that we can have that added support for them and for us as parents. Sometimes that connection needs to be with a professional therapist or medical professional. Having a team of people that know and care about our kids is key. And finding those people that our kids can connect with those professionals is so important. Getting them that added support when they are really struggling and even when they're not really struggling to continue that added support is really important. We've also learned to let go of things that don't really matter. School is a huge trigger for my son. It's overwhelming and it's difficult he really struggles with a lot of learning disabilities as well. So we have dropped a lot of expectations when it comes to school. If he gets up and goes to school, that's a victory. Um, and we have let go of a lot of things because our focus right now is his life. Um, we have let go of clean rooms and punishments. We focus on life and love and to see him for who he is rather than focusing on his behaviors and get him added support when those behaviors are really challenging. And the third thing is to meet him where he's at. Some days he just can't get out of bed to go to school. And instead of yelling and punishing and threatening, we try to meet him where he's at. One of my philosophies when my kids are struggling with their mental health is to treat it like the flu. We nourish, nurture them and hydrate. Um, we treat them as if they were had a broken leg or a heart condition or the flu and realize that mental Mental illness is physical illness, and it's so important to focus on that. Um, also believe them when they say they're struggling. Maybe it, you have to go to them instead of expecting them to come to you. You go to their room, you take them a drink, you rub their back, you try to get them to open up. You let them know that you are there regardless of where they are at. We cheer for him when he has a great day, and we understand and empathize when he's struggling. For us, love is the best form of suicide prevention. That relationship and that connection is the most important thing that we do in our home. Um, not just with this one particular son, but with all of our children. I, it's the best thing we can do. Of Love is our superpower as parents, and sometimes it's the only tool that we have in our tool belt. When all else seems too challenging, we can love our kids. Um, and that's about all I had to say, but I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share, share this and um, so grateful for a courageous, amazing son who um, is choosing to stay. Thank you. And with that, we will pass it on to Dr. Coffey. Thank you. And thank you, Cheryl, for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Diana, on behalf of the TAA for inviting me to participate in this really informative and wonderful webinar. To Dr. Marshall for sharing the resources from AFSP, which we so depend on in mental health. And to Cheryl and Alan for sharing very personal stories that bring this all home in terms of the science and the research. So if you could advance the slide, please. 
So I give a lot of talks and we have to disclose any potential conflicts of interest. So I'm disclosing any potential conflict of interest. I won't go over this in detail, but there really are no conflicts with regard to this particular brief presentation. I am co-chairman of the Medical Advisory Board of the Toronto Association of America, but I don't receive any financial support for that. We do receive some funding for some talks from the partnership between TAA and the Centers for Disease Control, but that's not part of this uh, particular in a seminar tonight. Next slide, please. So I had the good fortune of being very interested in suicidality. I'm trained as a child and adolescent psychiatrist and this goes way back even before my um, experience in working with uh, kids and adolescents and adults with uh, persistent tic disorders and Tourette syndrome. So we had the good fortune of being able to access data from the most recent impact survey that the Tourette Association of America um, uh, initiates with uh, membership, both adults and children. And for this particular presentation, I'm going to focus on the data from uh, parents who are reporting about their children. There is also data from um, other uh, people who participated in the survey. Almost a thousand individuals participated. But I'm just going to focus on um, the parents of children since I think this is such an important issue in our young people. So we do know that children with persistent tic disorders have an elevated risk of experiencing suicidal ideation. And so I think it behooves us as clinicians and investigators to really dig deeper into understanding that, to understand what those risk factors are that Dr. Marshall pointed out at the very beginning in a bit more depth. So our objective of this study and looking at this particular data from the impact survey was to examine suicidal ideation and self-harm among children with Tourette's disorder and explore the impact of what risk factors that might exist in our Tourette's community for suicidal ideation and self-harm. So we were able to access data from the TAA impact survey. Looking at that, and in this analysis, as I said, I'm only gonna report on parent responses about their children under age 18 who had a tic disorder. So we looked at several things. One is, what was the prevalence? What was the proportion of people in this survey who uh, reported suicidal ideation or self-harm behavior in their children? We also looked at several other risk factors that we thought might contribute, including psychiatric comorbidity. And as Alan very articulately described, things like depression, anxiety, uh, other comorbidities like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, learning disabilities. All these things are very important challenges to parents of children with uh, Tourette's disorder and persistent tics. And so we wanted to look at how did that align with or map onto the risk for suicidal behavior. Another thing that we looked at is discrimination. And as Alan described, the experience of being bullied or victimized by peers in school or elsewhere is a very important risk factor that we wanted to, to understand in more depth. And then finally, um, tick-related disorders, negative impact on school experience. Um, Alan described not wanting to get out of bed and not wanting to go to school for a while, and being really buoyed by his friend and his parents in sort of recovering from his episode. So all of these things looking at it from a very microscopic level are important risk factors on, on the likelihood of suicidal ideation or self-harm. Next slide, please. So we had 567 parents who responded, which is a remarkable uh, response rate in tribute to the TAA and the work that they do in involving the community in these kinds of surveys. And we found a result that was really quite alarming to us, that 32% of parents reporting on their children described suicidal ideation or self-harm in their kids, um, compared to, of course, more parents who said their children hadn't experienced suicidal ideation or self-harm, about um, over half of those. 
But when we began to dig a little deeper and look at what were those risk factors, we found that almost 85% of parents whose child or adolescent had reported suicidal ideation or self-harm also had struggled with comorbidity as one of the biggest problems compared to a far less proportion of parents who hadn't had their kids struggling with suicidal ideation. And likewise, we found um, three quarters of parents whose kids had experienced suicidal ideation or self-harm also had struggled with discrimination. Their children had struggled with discrimination compared to a much lower number in those kids who hadn't reported suicidal ideation. And then remarkably, 93% of parents whose kids had reported suicidal ideation or self-harm also had experienced a negative impact on school or in school compared to a far fewer uh, of those who hadn't had suicidal ideation or self-harm. If you can go on to the next slide, please. I think this gives you a very nice kind of um, sort of visual for this. Um, actually, it's the slide after that, but this one just gives you the data uh, looking at, this is the parents whose kids had had suicidal ideation, these hadn't. And if you just look at these numbers, 84% had had comorbidity as their biggest challenge, 72% versus not. That just means that's a statistically significant difference. And likewise, discrimination in those who had SI or SH versus those who hadn't, a statistically significant difference. And uh, as well, with the negative impact on school for those whose kids had experienced suicidal ideation or self-harm versus those that hadn't. So that's kind of the data. That's what we were confronted with when we looked into this analysis. And if you go on to the next slide, please, you'll see the visual, which I think is really a very um, clear uh, look at what we're talking about here. So 32% of children with a tick disorder have considered suicide or have self-harmed. And if you look at risk factors, here's the column to attend to. For those that had 84% or 85% versus 72% of those that hadn't had struggled with comorbidity, three quarters of those had been discriminated against versus a little over half who hadn't been discriminated against, who didn't have suicidal ideation or self-harm. And then this huge amount of those kids who had experienced suicidal ideation or self-harm uh, versus those that hadn't had had a negative impact in school. So the next slide should show the conclusions for this and I think point in some future directions. So in summary, according to parents, children with tick disorders have an alarmingly high rate of suicidal ideation or self-harm. And the rates of discrimination and negative school impact were very high in kids with tick disorders and even higher in those with tick disorders who'd experienced suicidal ideation or self-harm. Psychiatric comorbid disorders were deemed the most challenging factor in uh, parents of children with tick disorders in their management and had a high influence on whether or not they had suicidal ideation and self-harm. So overall, the take-home point is kids with tick disorders experience an elevated rate of risk factors associated with suicidal ideation and self-harm. Now, there, as, with, as with two of any study, there are limitations. First of all, these were just parent reports. This didn't have to do with interviews directly with parents or of interviews with children. So there's that limitation. And additionally, and we're hoping to dive a little bit deeper into this in the TAA Impact Survey 2.0, is that we need to differentiate suicidal ideation from self-harm. Because unfortunately, and as Cheryl and Alan are very familiar with, sometimes complex ticks in, them, in and of themselves can be self-harming, even though there's no intent to hurt oneself. Like poking oneself, uh, pinching oneself, cutting oneself. There's reasons to explain that in other ways in outside the Tourette's community, but in individuals who are dealing with a chronic tick disorder, those kinds of self-injurious behaviors can be um, really triggered by a tick themselves. So our next step is to try to separate that out and truly understand 
uh, the, the risk factor for suicide ideation and self-harm. We think this is very real. We found in our survey of adults that over half of adults had experienced some suicidal ideation or self-harm. So to me, this is really a public health issue that we all need to attend to in the community. So again, I want to close by thanking um, Diana and the TAA for inviting me to participate and for um, hearing the stories of uh, Cheryl and, and Alan. So th thank you. Well, thanks to all of you. I want to thank our presenters before we get to Q&A. So thank you to Dr. Marshall and Dr. Coffey for sharing your amazing expertise. And I also want to thank Alan and Cheryl for sharing your personal stories and your experience and advice to others. So that is beautiful and thank you. Um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and take questions and answers now. You should have seen the Q&A box in the panel to the side and those are being tabulated. And I am going to ask Wendy Wegman with TAA to um, ask questions to the panel, please. Thank you, Diana. I just want to remind all the attendees to um, complete a survey for us as well. Um, there's a QR code here that you can use to complete the survey, and it is also in the handout section um, that is on your panel. Um, the slides will also be are also available for you on the panel um, in the handout section, and you can access those um, the resources that um, that were shared at the very beginning. Um, I am not seeing a lot of questions come in yet, but I do have one here, and I want to remind attendees to put any questions in the question box um, for any of our panelists tonight. Please go ahead and do that. Um, here is one question that we did answer a bit. We did talk about some of the research that is being done. Um, know if that's me with that noise. I just wanted to mute myself and shut it off, make sure it's not hurting everyone's ears. Um, if the panelists can all make sure that they're muted. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so here's a question. What has research shown in the connection between Tourette and depression, ADHD, and suicide in terms of genetics? And this is a question from somebody who says that they have had Tourette um, since they were about eight years old, and that was 1962, before it had a name. And they just want to know what research is being done, um, I think in terms of genetics. I don't know if anyone on the panel, maybe Dr. Coffey, if you have any information on that. Sure, uh, thank you for that question. That's a very important question that we are actively investigating as we speak. There are two large consortia, both are international. The Tourette Association of America was important in initially sponsoring the uh, uh, one of the consortia. They're working on our understanding of the genetics of Tourette syndrome um, in an ongoing way. We know there is significant genetic overlap between persistent tic disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. That's been very well described in their genetic studies to date. We are not yet as sure about the relationship with ADHD, whether it has a genetic um, correlate uh, with Tourette syndrome, but we know in the clinic, uh, absolutely, we see uh, more than half of individuals with a Tourette syndrome also have ADHD, but we're not sure there's a true genetic um, risk factor there, as we know, has been established with uh, uh, OCD. In some of the genetic studies that have been done, they show that depression is complicated and may not necessarily have a genetic correlation with Tourette's, although it does seem to have a correlation with obsessive compulsive disorder, which also maps onto Tourette's. So sorting out those complex pictures is really what we're doing as we speak. Um, so yes, those things are somewhat related to one another, particularly Tourette's and OCD. Um, possibly depression has a relationship with OCD. And today, ADHD is kind of considered a separate issue. But these studies are actively going on. And let me take a moment to um, 
uh, let you know that if you're interested in participating, please contact the TAA because we're always looking for more, more families. Um, the more families we have enrolled in this, the more we can understand about these uh, complicated genetics. So I hope that at least addresses parts of the question. Thank you, Dr. Coffey. Um, here is um, a question for Alan. Um, Alan, are there any techniques that you use to keep you going in calm anxiety? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that kept me going, we'll go with that for, to start, is um, I also dealt with self-harm as well as ideation. And one of the things that I did was um, I got a big stack of sticky notes and I would write things that I needed to remind myself and hear that I didn't believe in myself. Things such as like, you were strong enough to get through this and things like take your own advice, which was a problem that I dealt with really badly at the time because I would try to help other people give them advice as to what to do to get through things and then just completely ignore that and not apply it to my own life. And I would lay them about throughout my room or on my phone, which is, or my glasses. So I saw them first thing I did when I woke up in the morning just to remind myself to keep going and the ways to do that. Um, I would say for anxiety, I use a lot of the combination of diaphragmatic breathing and muscle tension relaxation whenever I'm feeling panic attacks coming on or other just bouts of anxiety that I feel I can't get through. I also turn to music. That is also something I go to a lot. And I know a lot of other people that use that too. Now, it's very easy to feel very anxious and depressed and sad and just want to turn to music that is displaying the exact same type of things that you're going through. And I've fallen victim to that as well. But it's something that I've noticed isn't helpful. I try to find songs that have a more hopeful and uplifting tone to them. And even songs that are about struggling but end off with um, lines or verses that are about overcoming. Like uh, there's, there's a line in a song that says, I woke, today I woke up to a brand new me. I know I can't rewrite history. Yesterday is gone, but I'm ready for what tomorrow brings. That's from one of like my favorite songs. And I end up turning to that a lot uh, whenever I'm feeling very stressed, anxious, or just down because of things going on. I'm unsure of what's happening. And just, I feel like my depression might start be coming back to get me. It's something that I like to focus on because music I'm sure is a crutch for a lot of people. It definitely is for me. And I think uh, surrounding yourself with that more stuff that you can relate to in terms of dealing with the anxiety, but also look as something that is hopeful and is something that you can look to to try to get better and get through it and um, face it and come out on top. Great. Thank you so much, Alan. I, am, I want all the panelists to know that we're getting a lot of comments. Um, thank you for your stories, Cheryl and Alan, and um, also um, gratitude to um, Dr. Coffey and um, Dr. Marshall for sharing these resources and um, a few comments of people who might be interested in a study. So I just want them to know that there will be a follow-up email after the webinar and um, my information is on there and you're welcome to reach out to me and let me know and I'll pass that information on. I have, um, it seems like one last question unless something else comes in here. Um, this question is for Dr. Marshall. Um, so Dr. Marshall, as the largest funder of private research in suicide, have you studied suicide in relation to Tourette or other tick disorders? That's a really good question, and I will definitely check our research study. We've been funding research since 1987, which uh, predates my time at the organization. What I will say is that some, the research that we do fund um, cuts across all sorts of um, types of research. So there's biological brain research, there's kind of treatment-based research. So you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we've looked at Tourette's within a study um, that might be a larger study looking at um, 
kind of other uh, comorbid co conditions, as uh, Dr. Coffey mentioned. I'm happy to check that and respond back if uh, if the person wants to identify themselves who asked the question. Um, but you should know that we fund lots of different research. And like I said, it runs the gamut of the types of research, treatment research, um, brain illness research, um, just kind of all sorts of studies. The other thing I, I wanted to add earlier, just in response to one of the other questions, is I think the um, whether things are genetically linked is a really important question. And it's one we're trying to answer about suicide as well. So for families that may have had a suicide death within their family, that's often a question that comes up, is this genetically linked? And we're learning a lot more through research about that. And it's the short answer is it's complicated because some of what we're learning about gene research is in an area called epigenetics, which is really about gene expression. So whether a gene, um, whether certain things shows up in a subsequent generation sometimes has to do with the environment in which that that gene or that person is exposed. So we're learning more about this every day. And I do hope that at some point we can say more definitively about Tourette's and suicide. And I appreciate Dr. Coffey's uh, survey results because they really show a need for that kind of research. And could I just add to the questioner? Um, I've actually been asked to join the board of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I was asked last year, but I had to turn it down because I just became a chairman of the department. But I'm looking forward, Dr. Marshall, to perhaps working with you and bringing to the table the awareness of Tourette syndrome and persistent tic disorders and the suicide risk here and really soliciting more research in this area because I think it's, it's very under researched in, in many ways. And I think there's a real opportunity now that we have this preliminary data to, to dive deeper into this. So I'm looking forward to collaborating uh, with, the, with the board. Wonderful, thank you, thank you both. Um, I do have um, one more question and just one more um, question for the panelists. And I have uh, one comment. I had a question about um, helping to find a provider in a particular state. Um, so we do have a find a provider link on our website at Tourette.org. You're welcome to go there. And like I said, there will be a follow-up email that you will receive after the webinar. My email will be on there. Um, I'm Wendy Wegman, the education specialist here. And you're welcome to reach out and um, I can help you out with that as well. Um, there is one question for Cheryl. Cheryl, uh, this listener, this attendee says, your outreach and story is very important as someone with five children. How do you balance the needs of all five children while meeting the one or meeting any one of them where they are? That's the best question ever. And sometimes I don't have the answer to it um, because it can be really difficult. Um, I think getting that out of support system outside of my husband and I is really, really important so that they have other people if, you know, cause sometimes kids don't want to reach out to their parents. Um, and so having other people that they trust, whether, like I said, extended family members or teachers or coaches or neighbors. Um, and I think it's just being aware of your children, spending one-on-one -on -one time with them as much as possible and um, just getting them the added support that they need because I can't do it all. Um, with five children, even if I had one child, I couldn't do it all because I don't have the training and the knowledge of a lot of the um, things that they are going to need. So I think getting that added support is so important. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, I think that that is it for our questions and our comments. Um, I appreciate all of the attendees who are on. I really appreciate our panelists tonight. If you haven't taken a minute to fill out our survey, it helps inform our further programming as well. Um, and on that note, thank you so much for joining us at this Tread Association of America webinar. Thank you for the collaboration um, with AFSP. 
and um, all of the panelists. Thank you for your time, your information, and your very cherished stories. We appreciate you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.